for our scripture, uh, we continue with our Lenten theme of deepening the journey uh, by going deeper into the parables of Jesus as Matthew records them. Uh, as you see, in my opinion anyway, the parables are just getting harder and harder uh, as, as we delve into them. And so uh, today's is especially difficult. As you'll see when you hear it, uh, there is violence in it, there is Matthew's kind of favorite phrase of the weeping and gnashing of teeth, and we come to these parables, and it really begs the question, what do we do with these? How do we make sense out of these? How can we, can we, and if so, how can we pull any kind of good news out of them? And so, if you were here a few weeks ago when um, we introduced the whole parable, series on parables, um, you heard me talk about how these are open-ended stories, and that these, uh, Jesus told these and part of our job is just to wrestle with them and try to figure out what, what do they mean for us today? How can we use them today? And part of the way that we can help pull meaning is if we um, go back to try to understand what they might have meant in the context in which they were written. What was Matthew intending uh, when he wrote this parable? And so today we're going to wrestle with that a little bit and try to figure out what on earth he might have been talking about in hopes of then trying to pull out some meaning for us today. And uh, one of the ways that we're going to learn about what Matthew was trying to do is to read his parable, his version of the parable, alongside how Luke, uh, another gospel writer, tells the parable. As you'll see, they kind of have very different interpretations, and so we'll be talking a little bit about that and what that means. So let us listen for the word of God. I got the easier job. I got Luke. <laughs> Uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 1, and chapter 12, verse 24. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of, of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon for a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. One of the dinner guests on hearing this said to him, blessed is anyone who will <coughs> eat bread in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said to him, someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of land and I must go out and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have bought five oak yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. And another said, I've just been married, and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to him, to the slave, go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave went out He said, Sir, what you have ordered has been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, Go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. And from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 22, 1 through 14. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, 
one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized the slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe, and he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him, hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The word of God. For the oh, gracious God, we thank you for these ancient stories, which uh, sometimes confound us, sometimes challenge us, sometimes comfort us. And we pray that you would just bring a word for us today. Open our eyes to see you in new ways, our ears to hear you calling to us, our hearts to fill you with us, and our feet to follow in your way. In your name we pray. Amen. So you just heard uh, two versions of the same parable. And uh, just by showing us, how many of you would rather hear Luke's uh, version <laughs> of the parable? Okay, anybody vote for Matthew? Yeah, I'm with you guys. Like, it's Luke, uh, Luke all the way. And part of the reason that I wanted to do that this morning is just to remind us that any time that we are reading Scripture, we're always reading it through the lens of the particular writer, the particular gospel writer. And they each have their own way of telling the story. Uh, one of the best analogies I ever heard was um, to think of gospel writers as jewelers who are putting together a pearl necklace. And out there are each little pearl. It's a, it's a parable of Jesus, a story that Jesus told. It's the miracles that he did. It was the places that he went. And each gospel writer is picking which pearls they want to put in the necklace and stringing them together in a particular way uh, to tell their story. And so um, for, for Luke, uh, one of the things we know about Luke is he was uh, writing to a Gentile group, so a non-Christian group. Of all the Gospels, uh, Luke was the most down-to-earth, the most human. It's where we get the biggest birth narratives of Jesus. It's where uh, we find him always hanging out with those on the margins. It's women show up the most in Luke's Gospel. It's where we get the prodigal son. And it's just very uh, grounded in kind of the muck and mire of life. And if you had to sum up one of Luke's core messages, it is that the Gospel is for everybody. Everybody's invited, especially those on the margins. And so when Luke takes this, par or this pearl or this parable, um, it's clear that that's the way he interprets it, right? It's this wonderful message of God's inclusion, welcome the blind, the sick, the lame, etc. Well, Matthew takes that same little pearl, some story that Jesus obviously told about somebody throwing a banquet and the people not coming and having to go out and invite others. And Matthew takes it in a really different direction or has a different spin on it. And um, it helps to remember a little bit of the angle that Matthew is coming from. You've heard me talk about this if you've been here in recent months as we've been working our way through the Gospel of Matthew. But Matthew is um, the Gospel writer that is most based in the Hebrew Scriptures. He's uh, writing to a group of Jewish Christians uh, who basically are either Jews by birth or uh, they've been Jewish Christian by birth, but they still have a lot of connection to Jewish uh, siblings or kin, and they're now at odds with those folks. And then they're also at odds with the larger Roman Empire, uh, that by the time that Matthew's writing in like the 80s or 90s CE, several generations after Jesus, there is um, started to be much more violence and soon persecution against these small, fledgling uh, Christian communities. And one of Matthew's core messages that he's trying to get across is that um, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus is the one that the people of Israel have been waiting for and longing for. And so he tries to uh, put that all the way through his gospel. 
Uh, the other thing that he's really interested in showing is that um, Jesus is not so much replacing like the law and the prophets, but rather he's a fulfillment of it. And everything that the law and prophets and ancient Israel has been teaching is come to fullness in Jesus and how he calls us to live, which Matthew calls throughout his gospel the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And he sets it out from the very beginning. Uh, you heard in the way back when we looked at the Sermon on the Mount, like blessed are the peacemakers and blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And it's this, it's this alternate reality uh, that's sort of set up over and against Rome and the violence of the Roman Empire. And so all throughout his gospel, Matthew is trying to teach uh, that Jesus is this Messiah and that to follow him is to live in this different way and this countercultural way. So this becomes important then in how he tells this parable and where he puts it in his gospel. So when we read the Luke passage, that actually is like partway through Luke's gospel. It's in a larger area where he's teaching about love and inclusion. Matthew, however, puts this parable at the very end of his gospel. So we're in Holy Week already, uh, which means Jesus has already entered uh, Jerusalem on the donkey. That's Palm Sunday, which we're actually going to read couple weeks, but in the gospel he's already there. And the first thing that Jesus does when he comes into Jerusalem is he goes into the temple and he overturns the money changers and the tables that were in there. Why have you, why have you turned my house into a den of robbers, he says. And in Matthew's gospel, that holy week is all about this escalating tension between Jesus and the religious leaders, so that they're coming head to head with each other. And so this parable that he writes, or where he puts it, is the third of three parables that really indict the, the religious leaders of the day and kind of call them to, to task. And he's trying to show, basically, this authority of Jesus. The, the religious leaders want to know, by what authority do you do these things? And Matthew's trying to make the case for why Jesus is this Messiah. So the story begins, we're going to delve into the story now. The story begins with this idea of the wedding feast. And this is important uh, in some particular ways. Matthew, or Luke, talked about it just as a dinner. But Matthew amps it up into a wedding feast. And this is significant because, first of all, a feast was a time of celebration. And in a culture where there was often famine, a uh, feast was really a sign of, of celebration and goodness. In the religious understanding, it was a time of uh, God, it was a symbol of God's great abundance. And the wedding feast in particular was um, a, real, a real celebration that involved everybody around. And for the king to throw a wedding feast was significant in a, in a couple different ways. One is in Hebrew understanding, there was a, an understanding that the Messiah would come, and often the Messiah is painted as a groom, and the bride is painted as Jerusalem. And then the other big symbolism uh, in this idea of a feast is that there was an understanding that when, that, that when the Messiah came, there would be this, what they call a messianic banquet, this huge uh, banquet that where everybody would be welcome at the table, there would be food for plenty, there would be drink for plenty, and there would be even enemies coming together, and there would be peace and justice in the land. And so when Matthew starts telling the story to these or has Jesus telling a story to these religious leaders, all that imagery would have been there for them. And it's a way that he's starting to say, this is, this is the Son of God. This is the one that you've been waiting for. So as the story unfolds, uh, the king has this wedding banquet. And uh, can you imagine being this king? It's like your worst nightmare. You plan this huge wedding and nobody shows up. I mean, have you ever sent invitations like, please let somebody come? Uh, and here, nobody comes. Uh, just said they refused the, the invitation. And so the king goes out and says again, uh, look, look, here's the menu, right? I've, I've, I have calves, I have oxen, come, and the feast is ready, come. And still uh, it says the people made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, killed them, and the king was enraged. And so this, this is really kind of a thinly veiled critique at the religious leaders of the day, at those who would have been sort of first on the invite list in the understanding. These are the people who've been studying the text, who are to know the Messiah is here, 
And, um, and yet, as, as the parable unfolds, they're the ones who've missed the invitation. And they've either not come, or uh, they've, they've been busy with other things, studying their scriptures or their laws, and uh, they missed the invitation. And he even goes so far as to say that some of them uh, have kind of killed the messengers, which you could interpret as killing the prophets, and eventually the religious leaders will be the ones to hand uh, Jesus over to be killed. So in the narrative, in, in how it unfolds, um, this really incites the Pharisees and the, and the scribes, the religious leaders. And it says after this parable, they look for a way to entrap Jesus. And uh, it really, in the, in the arc of the narrative, this heightens uh, how Holy Week is going to unfold. The question becomes then, why does Matthew add these other parts in there? Why does he add the part about the king coming and then killing all the guests uh, that were invited but didn't show up? And why does he add this whole part about being underdressed for the wedding, right? About not having the right clothes for the wedding. And uh, just, just hang in with me here. We'll, we'll try to unpack this a little bit. One thing in, in regards to um, the violence, um, because it's not, Luke and, and Matthew probably worked up the same source. But Luke doesn't have that part in his rendition of the story. And so people think it's Matthew added it on there on his own interpretation. And one way, maybe, just to account for the violence that he was seeing in the world around him. And so in um, about 10 or 20 years before he was writing this gospel, around 70 CE, so still several, a generation after Jesus, uh, Rome came in and sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and erased part of the city. And there's a way in which Matthew basically is making a commentary that uh, because we didn't follow this Messiah, or the, the leaders didn't follow this Messiah. Basically, God allowed this violence to happen, and Rome came in. Um, it's, it's a way of sort of trying to justify what happened, and uh, in my own view, it's not really the greatest theology. It's kind of like our Pat Robertson or Oral Roberts or all the evangelists that used to take acts of violence or acts of God and um, connect them to like particular people's sins. So. Uh, that's a hard one to try to understand, but probably what Matthew is doing. And then in terms of the actual wedding garment part, uh, no, one, no one really knows what that's about. Um, there's no study to sort of say, well, uh, what did this mean? I mean, if folks were out in the fields and working, they didn't know they were going to get invited to this wedding. It's not like they had extra change of clothes, you know, in their car or backpack or chariot or whatever. And if it was a custom, which no one knows, for the host to like pass out garments, why would he leave somebody off the list? And so there's no way to know what, what this was actually meaning, but um, in a literal way. But you can take it in a more metaphorical way, which is probably how Matthew meant it. And that at the time, there are other parts of scripture that talk about things, you've probably heard from this language before, put on the armor of God. Or clothe yourself in righteousness, in justice, in mercy. And the idea being that when you follow Jesus, or when you follow this new way of being in the world that Jesus and his followers espoused, um, that there would be an outward transformation in your life. That you would look different. You would act differently. You would, you would, you would be in a, a different part of society. And so... Um, it's similar if you think about if you were here two weeks ago when we looked at that another really difficult parable about uh, the unforgiving servant and the guy who had amassed this huge debt, like a bazillion dollar debt, and uh, the king forgave that guy. But remember, he turned around and the first thing he did was go out and try to say to the other guy, you owe me a piddly amount of money. And one of the lessons there was that for Matthew, that this transformation, this <clears throat> receiving this grace or being part of this life is supposed to transform you, make you different, make you live in a different way. And that if you don't, uh, there's this sense, at least as it's phrased here, you'll be cast to the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing teeth. We looked at this uh, phrase a few weeks ago also. And again, scholars don't actually know what it means. 
things. Uh, probably meant something to Matthew's community, but not necessarily to us. Um, what we do know is it's not talking about hell. That was a much later invention or concept. But this idea that there was some sort of separation that occurs. Um, and, and somebody said to me after we preached about it, or I preached about it a couple weeks ago, maybe we get a national team symbolize like the sadness or the anger when we realize we haven't been living uh, the way God calls us to live. And I thought, that's that's insightful. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> but all of this is to say that for Matthew, there's really a sense of that following Jesus means that there's a change. There's a transformation in your life. And it makes sense uh, if you think about it because they're this fledgling little community. They're trying to find their identity. And for them, this is a passage actually of deep comfort, that God is with them, that God is watching over them, that they are uh, chosen, that they hopefully have the right clothes on, that they are being called to live in this way, and that God will help weed out uh, those who might be among them that maybe aren't uh, living, living the right way. The question then becomes, so, so, what? so what do we make of this for us? Is there something that we can pull out of this for us. And um, as I think about it, this the last little part about transformation is the part that, at least if there's something redeeming in this, that's, that's where it is. And this idea, as we've been looking all these last few weeks at Matthew's Gospel, and this idea of um, the kingdom of God being what the world would look like if God were in charge, being mercy and justice and grace and Forgiveness, that God invites all of us to that feast, that part of the reason we're here as people of faith is to participate more in those aspects of life, to help build that realm in our world. And so if this is what's available to us, and we can taste of it from time to time, what this passage, I think, is saying is that we're all, we're all invited to this feast. This, this banquet table has been set, and God just longs for us to show up and partake of it. And so the question is, how do we respond um, to that invitation? Certainly there are times when we when we show up, when we are connected to God, to each other, to ourselves, when we, when we experience that grace and that forgiveness and that mercy in our lives. But there are other times, I think if we're honest, when we're, um, we're too busy. We're too busy just in the busyness of our lives. We're talking about that in the Sabbath in the suburbs. Lenten group, that sometimes it just feels like life is overwhelming. There's no time to come and partake of grace or rest or mercy or all of those things. Um, sometimes we're busy working toward other, other goals in our life that maybe aren't what God would want for us, but that's kind of where our energy was. Like our call to worship said, we're off worshiping idols of our own making. We're consuming lots of things or building up our, I don't know, whatever, our own uh, good things that we need, or empire, and Jesus calls us to give, give things away. Um, sometimes we don't come to the banquet because we think we're not worthy. Uh, we are invited to the banquet of forgiveness, but we don't show up because we're too busy still beating ourselves up, thinking we can't come and partake. And sometimes we're just too busy even doing good things. Um, how many times you, you all probably know, uh, lots of do-gooders, maybe even how I show up, but I got one more rally to attend. I got one more edit to put into the sermon before I can come and, and receive that kind of grace. And so um, I think the question is how how do we respond and how do we how do we show up and get to enjoy uh, this banquet that's been set for us? I think the last thing that this text asks then is uh, about that wedding move and how are we. How are we undergoing transformation? How are we letting God's grace and love and forgiveness um, move through us in such a way that it transforms uh, how we move and how we act and how we relate to the world? Um, because the hope is, is that if we come and participate on, in this banquet, that we will be changed uh, and that our life will, will show something different um, and, and that we are called to live in a different so as we can wrestle with these texts, and we've got a couple more parables uh, to
go while we make it through Lent. Uh, I would just <coughs> ask you really to, to, to take these and think about them and wrestle with them. Um, they're hard texts. They're hard teachings. And so how do you hear God's word in it for you? How do you, how do you hear an invitation to the feast? Where is God inviting you to uh, participate in love or mercy? justice or hope, and how is God, especially in this Lenten season when we are called to turn to God and turn back and reorient our lives, how is God calling for uh, that transformation in you? So may we be open to how God speaks to us uh, through these stories, through each other, and through the Spirit.